Waloha and good morning. Great to see all of you here on this Monday morning, November 3rd. It's Cyber Monday. In fact, right now, many of you may be taking a break from your holiday shopping, perhaps, to uh, join us for this conversation. This, of course, is Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Ryan Kalei joined by Yanji Denise. And Yanji, uh, we have another special guest here today. Yes, as we have on so many Mondays, Governor David Ige is joining us today. And of course, we saw some big news over the holiday weekend with Kauai deciding to opt out of the Safe Travels program. It's a major development there. We want to talk about that, what it means for uh, the, the program overall for the state and any concerns the governor may have to that. Also, how he celebrated the Thanksgiving holiday. So thank you so much for being here, Governor. Let's start with uh, let's start with Kauai's decision. Um, what are your thoughts on that and why did you grant that request? Yeah, so it's just a couple of things, uh, Yanji and Ryan. Thank you again once uh, for giving me this opportunity. You know, Kauai is really uh, calling for a moratorium. Uh, as, as you know, the um, COVID counts have actually been quite stable here in Hawaii, except for Kauai. Kauai has seen an exponential growth in the number of cases there. Uh, and, and, you know, they were at the very lowest uh, throughout most of this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, they were uh, in the very lowest of counts. Uh, they've seen an increase in the number of counts. For example, I, I know for the first uh, nine months of this pandemic, they had a total of about 60 um, cases and they had um, 60 cases since the start of the uh, pre-travel testing program. So they saw a significant increase in the number of travel-related cases, both visitors as well as uh, residents. Uh, and they certainly wanted to make sure that their healthcare system is not overwhelmed by those number of cases. So uh, they decided to take a time out. They do uh, intend to uh, rejoin the program as soon as they can get a better handle on that increase in cases on Kauai. Do you anticipate the other mayors in the other counties uh, potentially also taking that step in opting out of this? Or is that something that's pretty isolated to Kauai? How have those conversations been with the other mayors and the other counties? You know, I do think that all of the mayors, even uh, Mayor Kawakami on Kauai, you know, we're all trying to balance the public health versus the reviving the economy. Uh, and, and I've talked with uh, all of the mayors again on Friday. Uh, just talking about where they saw th their islands and what they um, continue to look towards. Uh, so right now, as I said, you know, the, the virus counts on all of the islands uh, have remained pretty stable, except for Kauai. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, the challenge is to uh, bring back trans-Pacific travelers in a safe way and that we don't see a spike in cases. And so far, the program is working uh, in the other counties. You know, we always like to bring in questions from the audience. Marie Streep says, we are not surveillance testing enough travelers. Um, it's less than 2%. So how can Lieutenant Governor Green say it's working? What are your thoughts on the surveillance testing program, how it's working? We have seen Mayor Kirk Caldwell say that it is not robust enough. What do you think? You know, it's it's always a challenge in um, in the surveillance testing because once they leave the airport, uh, it's hard to track them down and, and get them to participate in a, in a testing program. Uh, you know, the other part of that equation is if someone um, is aware that should they uh, test positive after being here, it'll ruin their vacation. You know, they don't have the appropriate incentive to try and participate in a voluntary program. I think that that's been the challenge uh, for all of us. You know, I, you know, people believe that I don't, uh, support a two test or a three test program. I definitely would support that. It's all about balance. It's about managing the resources we have. You know, we only have limited testing capacity here in the state of Hawaii. And if we need to send a test out of state, you know, it takes too long to get the results. Uh, and so it's about trying to balance the interests. We believe that the, the Safe Travels program is uh, working right now. We all wish we had more data. We, we wish we knew how many people are coming from California, for example, especially as we see the state of California locking down, uh, they're issuing orders to restrict travel. Uh, and here we are trying to encourage travel as long as they get a pre-travel test. You know, I want to talk about a proposal that has been put forth by Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell because of the new ruling that states that all the testing 
uh, results must be in hand by travelers 72 hours before arriving or else they will have to go through a 14 day quarantine. The mayor offering a, a proposal saying that they could use the facility at the airport that they've stood up to do testing for those that have not gotten their results, uh, get the, have those, you know, uh, those travelers take the test then, then quarantine for four days and come back to take another test. If both those tests are negative, they would then be cleared. What are your thoughts on the mayor's proposal about uh, allowing that second sort of testing or that other option for those that do not have uh, a, a result by the time they get to Hawaii? So, uh, Ryan, I think it's two separate issues that we're trying to deal with that get rolled up into uh, one. Uh, in terms of having a more robust testing program, we definitely want to do that. And, you know, I'm glad that Mayor Caldwell had uh, brought in that testing uh, trailer at the airport. Uh, and we're trying to develop a more robust testing program that can utilize that capacity. And uh, I continue to have conversations with Mayor Caldwell. We'll be meeting again early this week to look at what the capabilities of that unit is and how we can best use it uh, to really continue to bring in travelers in a safe way. Um, you know, the whole issue about having the test uh, in hand, uh, we did um, tabulate uh, the statistics that we've seen. And the challenge is that we've had almost 300 uh, travelers come into the state uh, and inform that they had a positive test after arrival here. Uh, and what, the, what has been the challenge is that, um, you know, once that happens, we've had hotels cancel their reservations. Uh, you know, they are uh, oftentimes put on a, a do not board list by the CDC where they can't leave the islands then for 14 days. Uh, and so even though it might be less than 300 of those cases, it could represent uh, if they became positive on the airlines and that they had to isolate the close contacts of those individuals. You know, it could be as many as 3,000 people who end up being on this no-fly list and cannot leave the islands until they're cleared. Um, and that's the challenge. How do we set up a program that uh, can accommodate them. The hotels have committed that they will accept those patients, but we do know that when we make calls and they arrive here, they are turned away from hotels. So we're kind of working through all of the, the logistics of what happens uh, you know, when someone is informed in transit that they are positive uh, and who will be responsible for taking care of them. Uh, until we can work through those details, you know, the policy is that we're letting the airlines know that anyone who does not receive their test prior to boarding will be in quarantine for the full 14 days. Wait, I want to get some clarification there because the last I had heard was that there were just over 40 visitors who had tested positive um, upon arrival. Did I, I just want to make sure I was accurate there. You said 300? Just about, just under 300. We did ask um, for the Department of Health to do a more comprehensive review of those who have tested positive. Now, um, that's uh, people who are part of the travels program. Some of them are residents, some of them are visitors, but we have identified uh, just under 300 who turned positive after arrival here in the islands. And were those folks, um, and I know it's probably hard to tell, uh, you know, which, which is which, but are those folks who um, did not test and then got their test here, or are those folks that uh, were, you know, waiting, were pending testing? Do we know that? Yeah, so, so a lot of them were uh, those who were pending tests. Um, some of them were, in fact, uh, came to the islands. Uh, and had a reason to go and get tested. Uh, they may have been symptomatic and, and um, you know, decided to get a test. Uh, some of them um, were part of the um, surveillance testing program and came here with a negative test, uh, got the second test upon arrival, and then were informed that they were positive. Let's talk a little bit about that that 72 hour testing uh, change that happened a few weeks back when, when you made that decision that all the results needed to be in hand. We are hearing from many visitors as well as residents who want to come back that they're having a difficult time getting these test results because of the surge in cases on the mainland and the amount of people that are now going for testing. Uh, what is your thoughts by those in the hospitality industry who say that 
uh, it, it's become very difficult for uh, you know those who want to come to the island to make sure that they have this test in hand. Uh, how are you sort of working with them around this? And uh, what, what are your recommendations for those that are struggling to find tests on the million to make sure that they meet this deadline? You know, certainly, I think, Ryan, it's, it's one of those things that we recognize that in those locations where the virus is surging out of control, it will be difficult to get a test, you know, and that's part of why we're saying that they need to have tests in hand. We are also working with the airlines, and we would definitely appreciate uh, support from the hotels if they can establish uh, partnerships with test uh, sites that are in those um, uh, those areas that uh, have the highest propensity to have um, travelers come to the islands, uh, then we would um, want their support. We want to establish as broad a network of um, testing partners as we can to ensure that people can get tested. Uh, but um, by the same token, those communities where the virus is surging, we definitely don't want to have people come here if they are having trouble uh, getting a test. We are seeing more asymptomatic people who uh, don't have any signs of uh, illness. Um, a lot of the national literature um, points to the notion that uh, there are people who uh, are asymptomatic that uh, can spread the virus and do spread the virus. And, you know, and that's why we want to um, um, find that balance of um, assuring that people can get tested uh, but getting the test results in hand so that uh, we're not uh, left with the challenge of of having a po COVID positive um, traveler here in the islands. You know, there's a pretty robust discussion happening right now in the comments. And rather than bring them all in, I kind of want to summarize some of what people are sure. saying. A lot of people have a lot of trepidation about allowing these folks to come in at all uh, without the 14 day quarantine. What is the economic benefit that we're seeing right now from the Safe Travels program? What kind of a difference is this making? Because I'm also seeing a lot of comments about unemployment and joblessness and whatnot. So do we know um, since reopening Safe Travels, what kind of a financial difference that's making? for the community? Yes, uh, 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 thank you very much for that uh, question, Yanji. We've seen a tremendous uh, improvement in, um, for one, you know, the hotels are reopening. Uh, you know, a month ago prior to uh, the Safe Travels program starting, uh, you know, a very small per percentage of the uh, hotels were open. I've asked the hotels to give me a uh, account of those that they are bringing back, but literally hundreds of employees uh, have been brought back on as we've started the um, Safe Travels Hawaii program. And, and so it has um, made significant impact. The unemployment rate is uh, slowly dropping. Uh, and I do know that uh, unemployment benefits is still a challenge uh, and will continue to be uh, but people are becoming employed and we'll be publishing some of those numbers uh, very soon. I want to go back to talking about some of these trusted travel partners that you folks are setting up. Is that something that you continue to look to expand? We're getting questions about certain tests that uh, like a university lab testing. There's other uh, specific questions from people have that are not necessarily on the trusted uh, partner, Hawaii partners. Uh, what is the criteria that goes into establishing that? And are you guys looking to add more trusted partners to that list to provide more options for people? Yes, we uh, definitely are looking to expand that trusted partners as broadly as we can. Um, and so we continue to work with all of them. Uh, we have been working with the airlines uh, specifically because we do believe that they um, can ensure that the trusted partners make their commitments to uh, take the sample and deliver the result in the 72 hour window. You know, we believe that that's the best way to uh, encourage uh, travelers to work with their airlines uh, to get their test. Uh, and, you know, in many instances, we don't have a direct connection to the trusted partner. It really is through the traveler or the airlines uh, that um, the most coordination can happen. And, and we definitely are working uh, with the airlines to see how we can improve the program overall. You know, make more uh, tests available uh, to those who want to travel. At the same time, really hold the trusted partners' feet to the fire 
uh, to get the, the results back to the travelers so that they can come to the islands. Oh, Kami's request that you were granted, that you granted, oh, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback here. Um, is there an end date or a hope hope to end date or is that just indefinite? That's the way it's going to be for anyone who wants to go to Kauai because of course there are resorts there uh, and there are plenty of people who are out of work on that island as well, but they have the challenge of only having nine ICU beds as you noted uh, at the right. top. So so what are, we, what are we looking at there? Is there a date that you anticipate being able to lift that requirement? Well, so there's two things, Yanji. I, I think uh, Mayor Kawakami has been working with the industry uh, in their resort bubbles. And so they uh, have the most properties that are participating in that program so that people who travel to Kauai may be under quarantine, but with the resort bubble, they can put a bracelet on and they can have full access to the resort area. Uh, and he is in the process of stringing in adjacent resorts so that it can be as broad an area as possible. So, you know, that notion of the resort bubble is in play in Kauai. Um, you know, Mayor Kawakami has said that he is looking at a minimum of two weeks to see what the impact is. He wants to get the virus counts under control. Uh, and that's what he's looking at. And, um, you know, I'm certain that we'll be uh, talking and and monitoring the number of cases on the island of Kauai as we make progress during this period. You know, as we head into the month of December, obviously uh, we know that there are a few weeks left uh, technically for the CARES Act funding to be spent. I wanted to get an update on that. Has there been any conversation that you've had or updates that you he you've heard that could see an extension of this CARES Act money? We know that there's a lot of resources that have been provided through this funding uh, through the Department of Health, through contact tracing, through things we see at the airport with the Department of Transportation. Uh, what, are, what is the status on that? And is that something that you think could potentially happen is the extension of the CARES Act? And if not, uh, where you folks are at in terms of spending all the money that was provided? Well, uh, definitely a couple of things about that, Ryan. We are working to get extension of uh, National Guard under a Title 32 authority. And that's where the federal government is paying for 75% uh, of the cost of the National Guard. And uh, that's separate from the CARES Act. Uh, although, you know, we uh, had a call, I just got off a call with the White House this morning and all of the governors again, or most of them, I would say 48 or 49 of the governors uh, is asking for extension of National Guard under Title 32. Uh, and so the vice president committed to make sure that that request gets uh, in front of the president uh, before the end of the year, that that authority uh, expires at the end of the year as well. Uh, you know, in terms of the CARES Act funding, um, they don't anticipate uh, the National Governors Association uh, and uh, my conversations with the congressional delegation. Uh, they don't see uh, action on any kind of uh, relief package before the end of the year. Uh, and certainly it looks um, like there won't be any action until um, the inauguration of the new president. So, you know, we are planning uh, on the assumption that um, CARES Act of funding ends. Uh, and so certainly that's a big concern, you know, right now we're using CARES Act funds for, um, you know, unemployment um, benefits uh, for those who continue to be unemployed. Um, you know, the food and um, rent and mortgage relief uh, were funded with CARES Act, and clearly the state doesn't uh, have the funds to continue those programs. You know, we are looking at, uh, um, based on the assumption that we don't get any further um, federal assistance about what level of uh, National Guard support we can uh, continue to, to spend on. We also are looking at um, contact tracing and testing as, as really um, primary responsibilities. Uh, and then as, as you had said, Ryan, there's a lot of activity at the airport with the screening uh, activities um, that we would uh, have to continue. So um, probably in the next two weeks, we'll have a better uh, idea about the things that the state will just pick up the tabs for because we know that it's critical to the pandemic response, uh, regardless of whether there's federal assistance. 
Of course, we're already looking to the new year and we're thinking about January and the ledge coming back into session and the budget. What are you looking at, um, you know, CARES Act or not? Obviously, there's going to have to be some pretty severe belt tightening. What are the areas that you think um, are the are the easiest to tackle or, you know, will, will be the most obvious when it comes to balancing the budget? Well, clearly, uh, Yanji, you know, we are looking at uh, a 1.4 to $1.5 billion shortfall, about 25% of the state's budget, uh, because revenues will be falling by about 25%. Uh, every department and agency will impact, be impacted. There's nobody that will be spared. We will um, be forced to be cutting uh, public education and the university, as well as um, you know, social safety net programs, you know, uh, we wish that we didn't have to. Uh, we obviously would be putting a priority on those programs, uh, but 25% reduction uh, in revenues is uh, just something that is so significant, it will impact uh, virtually all of the programs in state government. And so you're sort of crafting the budget right now, and, and as we know from past, you propose that budget I, I believe next month, middle of next month. Uh, yes. so that's something that you are actively working on now. And, and, and in these first few weeks or months that you've been working on this, what are you already seeing uh, as, as something that you're going to have to do? It, it, would it be furloughs and, and any layoffs of, of that sort? I mean, what is the realistic picture of that looks like right now? You Just know, so I, your answer. Yeah, Ryan, I wish I could say uh, some of those things are off the table, but it's very clear to me that all of those are, are on the table as we uh, speak. You know, um, we are looking at reductions in um, spending that we can control the non-personnel related um, parts of the budget. But, but you know, the budget uh, makes up 60% uh, of our state budget is uh, personnel related uh, salaries, uh, benefits, uh, retirement contributions that are required uh, and so making a 25% reduction um, when 60% of it is personnel uh, really does end up uh, impacting personnel uh, costs. Uh, you know, we are, are looking at, um, as I had told you guys earlier, we uh, did go to the bond market for a working capital loan. The state of Hawaii is borrowing money to make payroll uh, for the first time in the history of the state. Um, and we were able to um, execute that transaction. That gives us a little flexibility, but not much. Uh, you know, the, the state um, spending is significant and um, the re revenues are just not uh, happening. Uh, and so we definitely will have to be taking action in the next few weeks. How, how big is that loan that you've taken out now on the behalf of the state? Uh, we borrowed $750 million. Not significant amount, uh, Governor. We also want to, you know, talk about schools reopening. We know mm -hmm. that there have been um, a lot of questions that we've seen over the past few weeks and months about parents wondering what that's going to look like. We know that there's still a lot of uncertainty about the in-person learning. Is there any updates that you can provide us of what the DOE is doing uh, going into next year? Is that looking like it could continue to be a realistic situation for more uh, students as they head back into the potentially head back into the classroom? Yeah, so as you know, the Department of Health did publish criteria and guidelines about uh, returning to in-person learning. Uh, and it is driven by the 14 week, uh, 14 days uh, average of uh, cases that we see in each of the counties. Uh, and so the neighbor island counties are actually in a good shape. You know, they're at uh, tier three or tier four compared to Oahu. Uh, and certainly uh, the complex area superintendents are working with communities to schedule how we will transition from, um, you know, 100% online learning uh, to kind of blended learning where some of the students are coming uh, back to campus uh, for in-person learning um, in phases. Uh, and then, you know, getting back to full in-person learning when all students return uh, is definitely um, a few um, weeks or months out. Um, you know, it is a collaborative process. Uh, the schools are working with their communities. Uh, I do know that it's connected to people getting back to work when um, you have school-age children uh, and they are at home 
uh, learning for at least a part of the time, especially for younger children, uh, that's a real burden on the family. Uh, we are placing priorities on the youngest children. And so, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade graders will probably be returning uh, ahead of others because we know how important it is, especially for the young children to have in-person face-to-face interactions. Uh, two uh, two quick questions. One is mass compliance. How are you? Are you feeling like the now that you've changed the parameters of the of the mask mandate? Do you feel like that there's more compliance? Is there any data to back that up? Um, and then the second thing is vaccines. What are your thoughts on that? Um, what you know? Do we have any updates on how soon we could see that? And will you be getting a vaccine? Yeah, so certainly a couple of things about that, uh, Yanji. Um, yeah, I did uh, get a run in at um, my running spot this uh, weekend, and I did see a um, higher level of uh, people wearing masks, even outdoors and um, uh, as, as people are exercising. Uh, the number of people who did not have a mask on was very few. Um, and so I, I do believe that uh, people are wearing masks, you know, when I've had to run out uh, to pick up a few items. Uh, at Long's or the grocery store, um, you know, I see uh, compliance uh, virtually with everyone, you know, very high compliance, uh, especially in the retail areas, you know, Long's Drugs or the grocery store, virtually everyone uh, is wearing a mask. So I know that's anecdotal. The university has a process that they're uh, uh, measuring mask compliance and it's on our dashboard. Uh, but I, I think that people understand what their responsibilities are. Um, on the White House call this morning, uh, the vaccines are progressing uh, through approval and they do uh, anticipate approval of the vaccines, one, probably two, um, before the middle of December. Uh, and so uh, we're working with them to understand the number of doses that we would have of the vaccine that we would uh, need to be able to distribute. Uh, you know, all across the country, we're seeing that um, priority 1A, uh, those who would get the vaccine uh, first uh, are uh, first responders, you know, healthcare uh, workers that are, are providing uh, care for those uh, infected with COVID. Uh, 19 and uh, those in long-term care facilities. So the patients and staff uh, in long-term care facilities are those that are in priority 1A. Uh, So we do anticipate getting um, vaccine doses before the end of the year. uh, And those uh, in priority 1A would be those who would uh, be getting them. When we are uh, looking at the vaccine and, and just looking forward maybe into next year, let's say into the middle of next year where it is more readily available, there are people in the community that have gotten the vaccine. What will that look like uh, overall in that blend of those who have the vaccine, those who haven't? Uh, you know, will establishments require, could require people to have a vaccine in order to attend or to come to an event? Or, I, I mean, how are, how are we going to sort of manage this mixture of those who choose to go with the vaccine and those who don't? And how do we return to some sort of sense of normal life with this combination uh, of vaccine and those who have not been vaccinated? It, you know, just a couple of things, Ryan. What I, what I tell people is what I will be doing personally is I will continue to act as if I'm infected with the virus and take all the precautions that I can so that I don't infect those that I love. So I'm going to be wearing a mask Uh, until the overwhelming majority, 60 or 70 percent of the community is vaccinated uh, because that's what's necessary for us to get to uh, herd immunity. Um, I think that you'll begin to see different kinds of policies, you know, especially for us here in the islands, because travel is so important. Uh, as As you are aware right now, all of the international countries have stopped travel from the U.S. You know, the number of virus cases in the U.S. is so high, it's the highest in the world, and nobody wants a travel coming. So I think you'll see um, international destinations might require a vaccination prior to travel and those kinds of things. I don't believe you'll see businesses or uh, airlines or travel within the U- U.S. requiring vaccination prior to travel just because of uh, the nature of our uh, civil rights and uh, the authorities and responsibilities that uh, 
governments, uh, entities, or businesses might have in allowing or preventing a service to people. Um, so I think that we'll see a period of time where um, some will be vaccinated uh, and others won't. And I think all of us should continue to uh, heed the warnings. You know, we'll have to manage uh, the restrictions differently, I think, moving forward. Uh, but I think the assumption will be that until we get to 60 to 70 percent of the people have been administered the vaccine, that we will continue to have restrictions uh, and need to manage personal interactions between people. Okay. Well, Governor, we know that you're a very busy man and we appreciate all the time you've given us just in the last minute or so that we have. We'd like to get a final thought from you on this Monday. I really uh, just want to thank everyone for taking personal responsibility. You know, I uh, did get interviewed by uh, national media and they asked why um, Hawaii was doing so well in this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I said it's because I think uh, we all learned a long time ago that we can only be successful together. People understand the sense of community and the obligation that each of us have to each other uh, in the broader sense of community and that uh, most in our community are willing to take the precautions uh, and live with the restrictions because we know if they don't, uh, I can impact uh, you, Yanji or Ryan uh, by uh, not doing the things that I need to do. So I, I did wanna just thank the people of Hawaii. Um, I'm proud to be governor of Hawaii and we have responded well to the pandemic um, the virus uh, does not recognize boundaries, and so we all need to remain vigilant. Uh, you know, this Thanksgiving was very different for uh, the Ige family. Uh, we had no gatherings uh, with the families that we love to gather. Uh, we had uh, several virtual gatherings uh, and had the opportunity to share uh, with uh, family members in a different way. Uh, but certainly it's something that we all need to do. Uh, throughout the holidays, uh, Christmas and New Year's coming up, uh, we need to do our part to be successful in this battle against COVID. All right, Governor Ige, thank you so much uh, again for signing the week with us. And uh, we look forward to hearing more for you uh, going into December and the end of this year. Thanks so much. Aloha. Thank, thank you. you. Well, Ryan, some some very interesting things that he had to say there, and that was the first time that I had heard that number of around 300. Uh, you know, before I think we had heard around 40 people had come into Hawaii with the virus, but now he said, it, you know, that's a combination that also does capture the people who were tested positive later in surveillance testing. But still, that that number is pretty high and a you know a pretty compelling argument for why you need to have that test in hand before you board the flight as opposed to waiting for it having it pending and he did describe a kind of impossible situation if you're a traveler um, getting here finding out that you're positive and then having a hotel that might refuse service having an airline that will say hey we don't want to put you on our flight because you're gonna you know jeopardize our crew and the other passengers and so you're kind of in no man's land you're not at home so you know when you hear that as frustrating as it might be for folks on the mainland who want to come here and can't find a test, that 300 number really does present a compelling reason. Yeah, it sort of justifies his argument as he's saying why they have implemented that rule of having that testing in hand by the time people arrive here. Of course, he said that he will continue to work with the mayor on his proposal of having that additional test option for those who uh, you know may not have had that opportunity to get that result and, and be able to take a test at the airport here in Honolulu. But he said he will be talking to the mayor early this week to see if they can figure out some sort of resolution and the different scenarios that might allow for further assistance in that area. Uh, also interesting to note just the overall budget. He's saying that it is a realistic and a likely expectation that they will have to look at furloughs and cutting, again, 25% of the state budget, uh, there'll, there'll be a shortfall. And so they are having to look for, of course, a number of different options and recognizing the fact that that could, will be a likely a reality for many state uh, government workers who will find themselves having to uh, take some furlough time heading into this new fiscal year and into 2021. 
Yeah, and pretty tough also to hear that he said every department is on the table. That includes the University of Hawaii and public education. Um, a lot of people are going to be very upset about that. You know, we know that public education uh, is so important in our community. It already is by many uh, observers say it is underfunded. Uh, we have a teacher shortage, and now we are looking at possibly having to do more cuts in an area that really can't stand any more cuts. So that is very tough, um, and he will be presenting that. As you noted, he'll be presenting the budget sometime in the middle of next month. Yeah, so we, you know, we look forward to having more conversations. The governor has agreed to continue to join us in the month of December, so we look forward to those conversations. Another conversation that we are looking forward to is speaking with Kauai Mayor Derek Kawakami, who if you watched this broadcast from the beginning, we started off about sort of the opt-out uh, uh, protocol that Kauai is taking in this Safe Travels program. We're going to be talking to the mayor about that. That's right. He'll join us on Wednesday right here at 1030. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking to Dr. Libby Char. She took over for Bruce Anderson as the head of the Department of Health. We have not had a chance to talk to her on this program. We'd love to hear about what changes she's made in the last few months. Also, we want to hear her thoughts on vaccines, mass compliance, and how you know surveillance testing, contact tracing, all of it. We're going to be covering that with her on Friday right here at 1030. That's right. So until then, we thank you all for your comments. We know there's a lot of them. We try to summarize as best as we can because we know that there's so many questions uh, and so many of you are, who have uh, concerns that you want the governor to address. But we try our best to summarize them. And uh, we hope that you'll join us here on Wednesday at 1030 with Mayor Kawakami. Until then, aloha. Aloha.